Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Joan Woodward, and I'm honored to lead the Travelers Institute, which is our public policy division and educational arm of travelers. Welcome everyone back to Wednesdays with Woodward, our webinar series where we convene leading experts, as you know, for conversations about today's biggest challenges. So thanks for joining us. Uh, of course, as you know, we also have a disclaimer. So before we get started, I'd like to share uh, that about today's program. And then a huge thank you for our webinar partners today, the Risk and Uncertainty Management Center at the University of South Carolina's Darla Moore School of Business, the American Property Casualty Insurance Association, the Masters in FinTech program at the University of Connecticut School of Business, and the Metro Hartford Alliance. So thank you all. As you may know, the month of October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and is really designated by the US Department of Homeland Security as such. Today's program is part of a month-long educational program series at the Travelers Institute. We call it Cyber, Prepare, Prevent, Mitigate, and Restore, which we launched in 2016 for our customers. We've hosted more than 50 live events and virtual events in this series. And last week, we held an in-person event in Minneapolis. Some of you may have been there. Tomorrow, we're in Los Angeles. And if you're in the area, please see our website to register. We have a few seats left, a complimentary lunch in downtown. So today on this webinar, we're gonna talk about a new law that will enhance our country's ability to combat cybersecurity threats against critical infrastructure. This is important. Um, this is a new law and we're gonna tell you all about it. There's a lot of requirements in this law and we will uh, break it all down for your business. But first, exactly what is critical infrastructure? According to CISA, which is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency within the Department of Homeland Security, it is physical and cyber systems and assets that are so vital to the United States that their incapacity or destruction would have a debilitating impact on our physical or economic security or public health and safety, end quote. So that's according to the Department of Homeland Security. So think about this in terms of like banks, power companies, water treatment facilities, transportation systems, hospitals, and much more. In fact, CISA says there are 16 critical infrastructure sectors ranging from agriculture to nuclear reactors, again, to wastewater treatment facilities. So their value to our national security makes them a prime target for cyber hackers and ransomware thieves. Think about the colonial pipeline attack, which shut down more than 5,000 miles of pipeline, leading to gas shortages communities up and down the East Coast. So that was a serious hack. Or the hack on the nation's largest beef supplier and meat suppliers that threatened meat supplies across the country. Or the solar winds hack that exposed the sensitive data of major companies and top government agencies. So with ransomware attacks like these increasing almost exponentially over the past couple of years during the pandemic, we really do need to ensure that our essential networks are secure, um, but protecting critical infrastructure is very complicated. So that's why uh, on today's webinar, we have almost 6,000 people registered because we want to know what's in this bill, uh, this law, and 80% uh, of this critical infrastructure is really owned by private entities, not the government. And I think that's a surprise to a lot of people that critical infrastructure is in private hands. So there's a lot of small businesses also that feed into this critical infrastructure. And that creates a potential entry point for these cyber thieves to exploit. So the small businesses that feed in various parts of our critical infrastructure are some of the biggest targets right now for cyber criminals. They're considered kind of that low hanging fruit for cyber thieves because of their vulnerabilities. So we wanna help all the small business owners on the call today to understand what's in this law. And that's why part of the government's cyber defense strategy is really to gain greater insight into the ongoing attacks uh, by these criminals. They require transparency and this new reporting requirement of this new law is really put out there in front lines of cyber defenses for uh, CISA. They're going to be required to report to CISA and if they've experienced a cyber attack or made a ransomware payment, giving CISA that critical and timely insight into the dark world of cyber hacks. And in theory, really the ability to prevent future attacks. 
So I know this is a lot, but this is important. And what does it mean for your business? And what is going to be required of you? How does a business know if he's, it's part of the critical infrastructure for society? What needs to be reported and when? And how can businesses prevent this ransomware from even happening to their business? So we have an expert panel today that's gonna join us to break it all down. Two uh, cybersecurity rock stars, really. Uh, first, we have Matthew Eggers. Matthew is the Vice President for Cybersecurity Policy in Cyberspace and National Security Policy Division at the US Chamber of Commerce in Washington, DC. He leads the Chamber Cybersecurity Working Group, which focuses on developing and advocating organizations' cyber policies before Congress and the White House. He frequently testifies before Congress regarding industry's perspective on cyber policy, legislation, and regulation. Then we have my colleague, Ken Morrison. Ken is Traveler's Assistant Vice President of Cyber Risk Management for Bond and Specialty Insurance. He provides subject matter expertise on cyber threats, cybersecurity, and emerging technology in underwriting, claims, and other teams across Traveler's Enterprise. In this role, Ken also helps Traveler's customers understand and mitigate risk. So with all of that, and I know it's a lot, uh, I'd like to turn the floor over to Matthew to kick us off. Matthew, you're up. Joan, thank you very much. Thanks for having the, the chamber and me with you. I'm gonna go through some very basics of the Circea. I think that's what we're calling it. Uh, there's some different ways to pronounce it, but that's what we're gonna go with until we're told uh, otherwise. Uh, moving on. So it's, it's important to note that this legislation is something that the chamber put a lot of time into our members in terms of crafting it, working with Hill staff and the administration uh, to make uh, improvements, uh, to make refinements. So it would be workable for both industry, those entities that would be reporting uh, and those that would be on the receiving end, principally CISA at DHS. There's a couple of things that are happening that I'll just uh, mention. There is a uh, request for information that is out. Uh, the chamber, uh, I would say our cybersecurity working group, something that I lead and we get together every Wednesday to look at things just like this. Uh, we're putting together our thoughts. There are also listening sessions. And unfortunately, there are just listening sessions. Uh, there's not a dialogue format uh, in, in this period of sessions that I think are going to go toward uh, the, the end of this month and maybe into early uh, November. So if folks are thinking, hey, how do I learn more about what's being asked as the rulemaking process gets underway? How do I offer feedback? Uh, that is a means or means to do that. And I've provided a, a link there, or at least something that can, people can uh, reference. Moving on. And I'm gonna hit on just some really simple elements of the CISA's final rule. I say final because that's going to be the end product. There's still a, a proposed rule that needs to be put out. We're not there yet. We're gonna be kind of getting to that point probably within the next year or two. That will come pretty quickly, but we're still at the early stages of everything. So let me kind of hit on a couple of things that are probably worth, worth uh, mentioning and highlighting for the audience. So what, what are the kinds of entities that would be covered? Uh, who were, uh, you know, would these organizations be covered whole or in part? Uh, the, the act itself has a focus on covered entities those entities that are part of critical infrastructure. There's a few other kind of criteria that uh, an entity would probably take on or exhibit, if you will, uh, that would maybe label it as, as covered entities. Things related to the uh, uh, attacks that would jeopardize uh, the economic and national security of the US. So when, when organizations think, hey, am I critical infrastructure? Or they ask, am I critical infrastructure? Uh, could I be covered? Uh, just by reason of being critical infrastructure alone would not make you a covered entity. And that gets to the point there, will my organization be covered? It's really still unknown. Uh, I think on some level, if entities were 
or are what they would consider to be Section 9A entities from a 2012 or 13 executive order that might put you in the zone of potential uh, coverage. Uh, the types of substantial or significant, there's a big difference. Substantial is not defined in Circea. Uh, significant is, and I think in a lot of ways, the, the reason we put that there, I want to highlight that is we want to make sure that a, the, the number of organizations are scoped. We're not covering too much. And the nature of the events uh, or incidents that would be reported to DHS uh, would be, if you will, the right amount. So businesses aren't reporting noise and DHS CISA is not receiving quote unquote noise. And so there's some, 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 some qualities of, of covered cyber incidents that are uh, notable, such as uh, key words like substantial loss, uh, serious impact on entities. There's a big interplay in the act between covered entities and covered cyber incidents. Uh, there's some things in there I'd probably mention in terms of procedures, which we can touch on, but uh, 24 hours for the payment of ransomware, meaning you have to uh, report to CISA within 24 hours of making that payment. That is really important. And then in terms of reporting covered incidents, entities have to make those report, uh, reports into CISA after reasonably believing that they've got a covered cyber incident on their hand. Moving on. Uh, these key safeguards. Uh, one thing I'd really highlight is we worked very hard, uh, probably in the 2011 to 2015 timeframe to get protected sharing, part of information sharing. Two kind of key safeguards that stand out, uh, legal liability uh, related to the submission of reports. Information shouldn't be used to regulate those entities that are reporting. And you want to make sure that when entities are disclosing, they are protected from disclosure. There's some other things here, but in, in the main, these key safeguards uh, relate very closely to the 2015 Cyber Information uh, Information Sharing Act. Moving on. Bilateral information sharing. I think the importance of this can't be stressed. It's not enough just to be doing reporting. Uh, entities are expecting that the data that goes into CISA gets collected, analyzed, uh, anonymized, um, and is reported back out to the private sector. Uh, it's also important that information that goes into the government in some situation, some situations is used to prevent future attacks or disrupt bad actors. And so the kind of the, the, the smart art here that I've got is to really show kind of a sequence and a um, interplay uh, uh, between the report and then information going back to uh, the private sector. Uh, that is really important. The, the name of the game here is getting better situational awareness of threats and taking steps to defend against and disrupt bad actors. Moving on. Well, thanks, Matt. And Thank you, John, for having me. And so, yes, here are the the sixteen critical infrastructure sectors. You know, it, and as Joan said just a moment ago, what makes a company critical infrastructure is essentially the systems or services they provide are just so vital to our national security, public, and health or safety. So that's kind of the bottom line. And let's talk about the the commercial facilities sector, for example. It has very wide reach. And includes the type of facilities that you know that draw large crowds of people for shopping, business, entertainment, motion picture studios, or casinos, or hotels, uh, theme parks, amusement parks, um, arenas, stadiums, you know, zoos, museums, even, uh, and public accessible real estate like office buildings and and condominiums and and actually retail establishments, so stores and shopping malls. So that's quite a broad. Uh, reach for that one sector. The energy sector, another one which literally powers the US economy, and it, it's actually made up of three subsectors electricity, oil, and natural gas. 
the electricity subsector, for example, has over 6,000 power plants. And all industries in the country and, and every other critical infrastructure sector is, is really dependent on the energy sector to provide power and fuel. So how do you know if, if your company is considered critical infrastructure? Well, a good place to start would be the, the CISA.gov website. Um, look for the infrastructure security link. And, and here you can dive into it, go into the pages for each sector and, and see what might apply to you. But you know, at the end of the day, all companies today uh, are encouraged to voluntarily report any kind of unusual cyber activity or incidents to CISA. Uh, the hope is, as, as Matt was saying, that by quickly sharing this information, CISA can render assistance, provide early warning uh, to help you know, other companies possibly from, from falling victims to that. Thanks so much for those kind of opening comments. We uh, really appreciate kind of understanding the, the nature of where the, the law is today. And I guess, um, as many of you know, I worked on Capitol Hill for about 12 years and writing these laws are not easy, but getting concrete input <clears throat> from the chamber and other industries really helps make these laws better. And so the comment period that you just mentioned, Matthew, is really important. Uh, we're gonna get into that in a minute, but first, I would like to turn the tables on the audience and we're gonna ask you an audience polling question. So this is easy. You just kind of click your answer. Uh, so do you think your business is considered critical infrastructure? Based on that list that um, Ken just uh, had up there. And uh, do you think you are critical infrastructure or not? And we're gonna get into some of these answers in a second here. So about two thirds of the audience, 60% say they are, uh, a third say they are not, and about 11% say they don't know. So um, I think that our audience answers really get to the crux of some of the confusion, right, over this law. I looked at that list and it seems to cover almost everyone except maybe nail salons or dog groomers, I don't know, um, but they may be considered as well. But Ken, you gave us a good rundown. I know our audience really wants to know, um, how does the business know if they're considered critical infrastructure and might have to report? Because I look at the energy space just, just to think about the energy space. And there's so many different areas of energy, right? There's solar, there's wind, uh, as you say, the nap gas and, and electrical um, and, and oil. Um, but Talk about, break it down for us in terms, give us an example maybe too, of a vendor or a third party that these critical infrastructure entities engage with uh, who might have to report. Sure. Well, you know, from the, the, the concept of reporting, uh, just remember that covered entities are probably gonna end up being a subset of the critical infrastructure. So not everyone in the critical infrastructure will be considered a, a covered entity. and and thereby be bound by the, the reporting requirements. So DHS is gonna decide what the specifics are, but you know, potentially, as you can see, the, the SWAT can be pretty broad when you consider that it could not only include those companies directly in the infrastructure, you know, like factories and hospitals and water treatment facilities, but, but their subcontractors and vendors and suppliers, and maybe their subcontractors and vendors and suppliers. And for example, with the chemical sector, let's take, right? So chemical manufacturing plants, um, you know, it's pretty obvious that's going to be uh, critical infrastructure, um, but the companies that provide transportation for the chemical chemicals, right? So the trucking firms and, and such, any company that provides warehousing or storage would be considered part of that critical infrastructure. And then take that to the next level, the companies that manufacture the machinery used in the plants or build the trucks, perhaps, or even the tanks or the pipelines, it, it, it goes on and on. You could kind of see how this logically goes from one company to the next in the in the hierarchy of how we do business in the in this country today no that's a, that's an excellent point um and I, and I also think about we get a lot of questions coming in the chat too right now about the financial services sector so obviously banks are on that list we saw that and of course the financial markets at writ large right the new york stock exchange the nasdaq uh, the exchanges out there, Chicago Board of Trade, you think about the financial infrastructure of the, of the country. Um, well, insurance brokers and agents are also considered finance, correct, a writ large. Um, so the question is, are insurance brokers and agents considered to be critical infrastructure? Ken, I'm gonna give that to you. 
I would, well, if you look at, again, you go back to that US, this isn't necessarily a plug for the, the US CERT or the CERT site, but it is terrific. But <laughs> on their site, they, they have the different critical infrastructures. Um, and if you look at the profile of the financial services sector, they said it, it's best described by describing the services offered. And one of the services that they include is risk transfer products. So yeah, I would say at least for critical infrastructure, you know, insurance companies, brokers, agents are probably considered critical critical infrastructure. Whether they're going to be considered a covered entity for the reporting, we're just going to have to wait to see what CIS says about that. Okay. I, yes, just, I was just going to add to that. I think Kent's right. I think that uh, you look at it from a critical infrastructure kind of envelope, and then you work your way uh, down. A couple of provisions in the law that I think help maybe scopes uh who or what entities may be covered there's a big emphasis on whether or not that entity is the target of a nation state or a proxy of that nation state or a surrogate uh some of the cyber attacks that we've read about in the news over the last kind of couple of years give you a feel for where policymakers sis are, are are aiming and the other thing is is the kind of the nature of disruption to let's say uh an infrastructure sector parts of the economy, we are talking substantial cyber attacks, uh, significant attacks. So the, the, the bar for at least reporting for many, I think, out there is going to be pretty high. Uh, and I think on, on a lot of levels, that's good. We don't want to be over over report. OK, so, so Matt, then tell us how these reporting requirements are going to help CISA prevent future attacks. How does that work? Because uh, are these the same dark web actors, the, the, um, the, the thieves that are trying to steal your data? Are, are they you know, repeat offenders out there? And, and the thought is CISA might collect data that would help them prevent. I, I just, I'm trying to make the leap between reporting and how they prevent future attacks. You know, a good way to think about it is there has been a strong effort to have industry report into government almost like a neighborhood watch. So we can figure out the doors we need to lock and so forth. I think the big shift with Circea is it's mandatory for a certain cross section of industry. Uh, and the two primary uh, uh, avenues requirements for reporting or the types of reporting relate to covered cyber incidents, substantial uh major uh, episodes and then if you're a covered entity and you happen to be the victim of a ransomware attack and you make a payment those are kind of the two things and under this law if you're covered you got to report so <clears throat> a couple of questions on the word mandatory are there fines or penalties or fees if uh, a covered entity is hacked and doesn't report matt i'll go to you on that yeah, sure, I'll start. Uh, no, I'm glad to say that there are no penalties. You know, it just cuts against the nature of public-private collaboration for there to be financial sanctions. Uh, legislation that we did consider early on had them. Uh, this legislation does not. Now, from an enforcement standpoint, if a covered entity is believed to have suffered maybe a covered cyber incident, or it made a ransomware payment and didn't report. The outcome is that CISA should conduct outreach to this entity. If that isn't really working, the CISA is authorized to issue a subpoena and it should stop there. There are other things that can happen, but for the most part, I think on balance with many entities already reporting, I don't think we'll get to that enforcement piece, at least I hope not. Okay, um, another question for you, Matt, and Ken will get right back to you. So are third parties, uh, including insureds, uh, insurers like us, allowed to submit reports for covered entities? So in, instead of the covered entity reporting on its own, can a third party, uh, again, report that? Third parties are authorized to report on behalf of a client. One thing I would maybe uh, highlight is uh, third parties don't have to report, let's say, on a client. There's no requirement to do that. So we don't want to spook third parties that are, let's say, having relationships with, let's say, one of your covered parties. 
an entity could ask an insurer, let's say, or maybe a law firm or an information sharing organization, hey, if you don't mind, would you make that report for me? Now, that doesn't absolve the covered entity from, from doing all that it needs to do because a third party is reporting, but there is that tool. Okay, so that's good news, I guess, for folks out there. Um, back to you, Ken. So what exact information will insureds have to share with CISA? Uh, when they do have to report a cyber incident? What, what exactly, what's the type of information that would, would have to be shared? Sure, and uh, so basically it's the who, what, where, when, how, maybe maybe not why, but the basics, right? So the, the name of the organization, when it happened, um, where the incident occurred, you know, who to reach out to, any kind of points of contact, uh, how severe the incident was, um, what kind of activity was seen, you know, and a description of what happened. Maybe the number of people or systems that were impacted. Um, if it was a ransomware event, what were the instructions provided by the ransomware attackers? What type of payment was requested and how much money and or how much of the whatever the payment is and when the payment was supposed to be uh, supposed to be made. And also there's like supplemental reports that that they're going to want as you as the as the incident continues. So if anything new or different, uh, becomes available or known, you're going to want to report that. Um, if you make a, a ransomware payment after submitting the cyber incident, so remember the cyber incident was in 72 hours, the ransomware payment is within 24 hours, the payment might not be made for a week or two after the incident, so you still have to report that. So any anything like that, you still have to comply with the rules. And then, uh, and then just keep them updated and you're supposed to preserve the evidence, preserve all the information and basically keep providing these reports until the uh, the issue is resolved. So will CISA at some point uh, after collecting this data, do you imagine um, when uh, a, a ransomware attack occurs on my business, can I go to CISA and say, okay, I'm reporting my ransomware attack and can I tell you who's re re uh, ransomware me and can you give me information back? Can there be kind of a real time sharing of oh, this bad actor, don't pay this ransom because he has a bad history of giving your encrypted data back. Do you think at some point, you know, Matt and Ken, there would be kind of that advice coming back from CISA to the person who's just been hacked? I do think that there is, uh, and the CIRCIA calls for it, is for uh, parties that, that report a ransomware payment to try to get a feel for who the threat actors are. Right. I think one of the things we're trying to do is, uh, is for the government to uh, attribute these kinds of attacks to parties so we can identify who they are and figure out a way to kind of uh, mitigate their their actions. Um, I do think that uh, CISA will uh, also uh, and one of the in terms of thinking about ransomware payment and ransomware uh, mitigation activities, there is a provision in the bill to kind of look at systems that tend to be susceptible to ransomware payments and work toward notifying owners of that, uh, let's say, IT, OT equipment. So Matt, back to you just for a minute. Uh, what must be included in these reports? We, uh, Ken gave us an overview of you know, the timeframes, but exactly what should the insured on our customer um, who's considered critical infrastructure, what they, what exactly do they have to include? Uh, I think Ken hit it on the head. Uh, I might add a couple of things. One, maybe from a policymaking standpoint, one of the things we're trying to urge CISA to consider is in that initial reporting stage, leveraging a very simple form, right? When you've got a crisis on your hand, you don't want to be spending a lot of time filling out reports, certainly when you've got a, sm uh, a small window of time to, to operate with. A couple other things that I think CIS is interested in, called for in the, in the act, uh, maybe some of the vulnerabilities in a, in a system or a network that might be in play or responsible for what's happening. Uh, if you can kind of give CIS a feel for your defensive posture, uh, and then maybe three, I think we mentioned this, is any kind of sense of threat actors that are in play. And typically what happens is maybe in a more sophisticated organization that works with third parties that can kind of help identify 
whether we're talking, let's say, a nation state act or something like that, that's the kind of information that is valuable not only to CISA, but then when they push that information out to uh, the rest of industry. Okay. And Matt, I'm not sure if you cover this. When does the law take effect? When, when is all of this? I know the comment period is kind of ending next month, right? It's November 14th. So yeah. if anyone's interested in, in, in issuing a comment back to CISA, um, but when, did, when do you anticipate this actually becoming effective? So the president signed the law in March. We are in what's called an RFI request for information stage in development of a proposed rule. So this has got two years from March 22 to develop that. And then 18 months after that, they've got, uh, they've got to complete a final rule. That's when really this program becomes effective. I think they're going to hustle a little bit more just given the sensitivity and the importance of this. But this won't become, we won't go game time until it, probably in about two to three years. And the other thing I would just say is, um, We've got a pretty good feel for the outlines of what uh, of what is going to be required of parties, but we won't know with much certainty until the final rule is completed. And I think as we kind of roll through, those entities that are likely to get covered will probably have increasing input, we hope, into the final contours of a, of a regime. Okay, so two, say two to three years. Um, what about the interim period? If someone is getting hacked or ransomware, uh, is there a place our insureds and customers should be reporting to the federal government right now? Is that the FBI? Um, is there a mechanism in place before this law take, takes place to report? I know it's not mandatory, but the government definitely likes to hear from private businesses when they've been hacked, right? Or, uh, Ken, you might have the answer to that one. Yeah. Sure. So, yes. So, voluntarily, vol voluntary reporting is certainly encouraged. And um, there's a couple different ways. So, uh, one is the ic3.gov website, which is the Internet Crime Complaint Center, and uh, that's one place you can report. Uh, and I believe uh, CISA also has a reporting mechanism. I believe it's report at cisa.gov is the email address to report any incidents. And um, on their website, they also provide the what type of information they want to see, and it's essentially what we just talked about. And uh, so as I said, and as Matt was saying, this information is collected, aggregated. You know, you might not be the only one seeing this kind of incident. Uh, they'll take all this information and put it all together and then and then see what larger threat is is evolving and looming and then use that information to keep us informed, tell us what indicators to look for. Maybe we can start putting up our defenses and and provide any kind of assistance that that they can provide. They they do have a pretty substantial cyber almost a consulting arm that they provide free of charge to uh, to the citizens and the and the companies in the country. And I just put a fine point on this. This this law, CIRCIA, probably wouldn't have been completed as easily if it weren't for the hard work that was put in a number of years ago to develop the Cyber Information Sharing Act. One of the key features is providing a suite of protections for entities that report voluntarily, either on their own or through a third party. So both your advice is if someone is hacked, they should definitely report because there's a, a bit of a advice uh, coming back to the entity who's been hacked from the government to help you maybe with your cyber hygiene going forward. Is that is, is, is that a good way to think about it, Ken? That they can help Absolutely. you? Absolutely. They, they can help. They can provide assistance. They can do vulnerability scans for you, for your environment uh, for free. Um, phishing testing, um, risk assessments. It's, it's quite a, a pretty nifty service. And does a business have to be a certain size to get that, or can you be a sole proprietor person working, uh, you know, in your own business? I believe it, it is any uh, any organization. All right. So, Matt, what have you been hearing from your chamber members? You have some of the largest uh, industries and companies in the world uh, as your members, and some of the small business owners. So, what it, what are you hearing from your membership about this new law? You're right. We're, we're big. We're diverse. We've got the majority, vast majority of our members are small businesses. I think in terms of the just to maybe um, narrow things a bit, I would say in the context of the RFI, you know, we learn a lot about laws that we work on when we kind of consider how we're going to implement them. So one of the questions that I think is interesting is going to need some work is the nature of an entity. Um, it's the feedback that we've gotten is 
are we really focused so much on the entity itself? Is that the bullseye or is it the nature of the cyber incident? And then you go from there. Uh, and I think too is not every organization maybe needs to be covered holistically, meaning you could have very large organizations that make very specialized technical equipment and they also make uh, home appliances. Do we cover that whole organization? Uh, the other thing I think is the furtherance of harmonization. You've got this new federal law that mandates uh, additional reporting on top of what entities already have to report uh, to different agencies. There is existing reporting out there. Uh, how do we bring that all together in a way that's coherent? We can maybe touch on that some more. Okay. And, and what do you think, Ken, maybe for you, what, what should businesses who are considered critical infrastructure, what, what should they be doing now to kind of prepare for the law when it becomes effective? Well, in general, um, you know, just make sure, you know, you're shoring up your, your own cyber hygiene, as it were. Um, you want to be able to um, defend against attacks, um, but you, part of what you want to do is have a, a plan in place for if and when uh, an incident happens. So an incident response plan. So you're not relying on your memory uh, when, when bad things happen. So have something written down so that you could uh, refer to, to who does what, when, and certainly you're gonna want to start including these reporting requirements and data gather gathering uh, steps to make sure that you've got what you need when you need it. Okay, and how will businesses know when how will businesses know? I know inside the Beltway, we're all focused on you know the the uh, regulations coming out, but will there be some sort of communications to let businesses know when it is effective? Because we said two to three years. That's a big that's a big difference between two years versus three years. How will businesses know when it's it's effective? I'll maybe just note that there is a provision in the law, and I think DHS system would do this anyways. There's an outreach campaign that they're going to have to undertake. They'll work with groups like yours, uh, insurance trades, the chamber, other groups. I think most affected parties will probably have a pretty good feel uh, for when things really kick off in, in earnest. I don't get the sense this is going to try to play a game of gotcha. Uh, it's generally not the approach that they seem to be taking. Um, and then on the kind of the, how do I kind of get ready? A number of critical infrastructure entities are already prepared reporting and so forth. Uh, the one thing I usually try to stress to organizations is think about the things that you need to do to kind of keep yourself business leaders out of the congressional hearing room chair. You're often not invited there for just a kind of a positive outlay of, of things you're doing. But do you have a cybersecurity story? Meaning if you had to write testimony on an event, do you like what you've got? And so you can think about all the kind of the the one, two, threes of, of controls or what have you, but think about that because for some organizations, that is really critical. So that gets us in, I think, to cyber hygiene and is your business uh, really clean when it comes to uh, you know, protecting it from a uh, ransomware or a threat and talk about the best practices that all businesses and organizations should be following. So I wanna get into cyber hygiene as our next kind of category. But first, I want to ask the audience another polling question just to see uh, where they are with their cyber hygiene. Does your business use multi factor authentication? And that's when you're trying to sign into something and they say, we're going to text you a code and you give us that code back and then we're going to let you into your system. That's multi factor authentication. And does your business use it? And use it across the board, not just for one thing, but use it for all your systems, because that's another thing we've seen is. People say, yes, we have MFA, but they only have it on the right side of their business and not the other side. So this is really good news and encouraging um, news that over 90%, 92% of our audience say they use MFA, but uh, there's still that 8% uh, that doesn't know or they're not using it. So first I'm gonna go to Ken. Uh, what do you think of these results? And of course, these are a lot of our insureds. And so our insureds <laughs> are ahead of the game because we keep talking about MFA, but give us your thoughts here. Um, those are tremendous numbers. Um, the 92% uh, folks using multi-factor uh, is awesome because if you look at the uh, 
again, re referencing the, the CISA site, they, they indicate they have a list of the most common security weaknesses taken advantage of by attackers. And the number one, top of the list, is multi-factor not being used or enforced. So seeing that number is is very reassuring. We're on the right track. And, and as you said, our our policyholders, hello, everybody, is a, part of our requirements as a multi-factor uh, attestation that you use multi-factor for things like remote access to the environment and for any of those accounts that have the keys to the kingdom, the privileged or administrator account. So that's really good, good to see. Good, good. So do we know yet, Matt, if um, a covered entity has to report a cyber incident, whether they have to report that they have cyber insurance or not, or we don't know yet whether they have to report that fact. No, they don't have to. I, I don't. I haven't seen any provision in that law that suggests that. That may come out in maybe a dialogue with CISA, maybe behind the scenes. But no, there's no requirement for that. No requirement to say you have cyber insurance. Okay, good to know. Um, let's go on here because I want to talk about small business owners. In Minneapolis last week, we held a live event with a couple hundred agents, brokers, customers with CISA and the Small Business Administration talking about best practices. And what came up a lot there was talking about small businesses because a lot of our uh, mom and pop insurance agencies there might be out there uh, considered a small business by the SBA. Uh, how do they up their cyber hygiene, Ken, in terms of risk control that you work on every day with our, with our clients and customers? What are the couple of things besides MFA uh, in terms of best practices? Well, yeah, it's absolutely true. The small businesses are are considered a lower hanging fruit. You know, they they might not have the the resources to dedicate to cybersecurity, or they might not have the funds to let them stay afloat for the up to you know weeks to recover from a ransomware attack. So this could make them even more you know susceptible to an attack or more likely to pay a ransom. So yeah, lower hanging fruit. Um, but the the good news perhaps is that um, cyber attackers. You know, for the most part, or in if just for the money, right? So if it's too costly to, to press the attack home, they might go somewhere else. So our my kind of mantra is make yourself a higher hanging fruit. Um, and you know, I just referenced the the weaknesses most taken advantage of by the cyber attackers uh, and multi-factor being top of the list. Um, so make sure you have multi-factor in place. Um, right behind multi-factor on the list is not having your software maintained, uh, keeping it patched and up to date. You know, some of the, the best loved vulnerabilities by the uh, cyber hackers out there are over 10 years old, 10 years old. So keep your systems patched um, all the time. You know, let Microsoft, the auto, if you can, the automated patches, the automated updates, uh, go through your system, keep things up to date. So that's, that's a big one. Another one is uh, use of a uh, vendor supplied default configurations, usernames, and passwords. And what I mean by that is when you buy a, a firewall or a router out of the box, it has a username and password. Um, and if you Google, what is the username and password to this particular brand of router, you will see it. And bad right? guys do that every day. So as soon as you get something like that, change the user ID, change the password, change the configurations and, uh, and, and move on from there. Um, and remote access. One, how oh, does go one ahead. Know, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say uh, remote access. So I think we mentioned this already. So remote access to your network, that remote access is the front door to your network. Uh, you want to use a good solid door. You want to keep it locked. You want to use a deadbolt and make sure that anybody trying to get in proves who they are. So solid door, use a secure remote access solution, like a good VPN. Lock the door. Lock down the VPN with tight, secure configurations. Use a deadbolt. So set up a firewall to detect or better yet prevent intrusions. And lastly, Use MFA to have them prove who they are. Um, open okay. ports to the, okay, I'm, I'll keep going, but. <laughs> no, 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 well, go ahead, one more, I'll give you one more. Open ports, what is that? Open ports, so open ports are kind of the windows and back doors to your network, right? So close all ports and services, only open the ones that you really need for your business and then reevaluate them periodically to make sure you still need them. Things like RDP, remote desktop protocol, uh, Telnet, um, these are ports, protocols that are kind of on by default and should never be open to the internet. And back to you, Joan. <laughs> no, 
No, and, and I get this question a lot. We have a lot of questions coming in. Thank you all for your thoughtful questions. I want to get to a couple of audience questions. How often should a, a, a small business kind of update their cyber incidents response plan? So everyone out there should have some sort of plan if you're hit with a ransomware or phishing uh, 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 attack you should have an incident response plan. What should be in that plan, Ken? This is the question. And how often should we test it or update that plan? Uh, great question. And what should be in the plan is based on what you do for a living, what your, your business is, um, you want to kind of have an idea of where the uh, the crown jewels are, what, what your primary business is, what your mission is, and be able to keep that going. Um, so you want to have steps for what to do, who to call, um, who does what, who does what when, and it could be as high level as just you know a, a single sheet of paper with primary and backups, which is very important of people uh, to take what actions to notify somebody, you know things like notify your security internet service provider, notify law enforcement if necessary, um, different you know ways to do set up a backup facility if you have to go to a different location do you have the equipment ready to do that um so basically it comes to just having it written down and and not leaving it to memory as i said before and then exercise it walk through take a again uh sissa sorry <laughs> has terrific tabletop exercise templates um so pick a ransomware template and go through it line by line this is what happens, what are you gonna do? This is what happens, what are you gonna do? And and actually, honestly, that's really key, is discuss with all the key players what happens when that happens. And then sometimes the answer is, I don't know. Sometimes the answer is, I can't do it right now. And that's what this whole purpose is. So figure out what you're gonna do. And then at least once a year, do that again, walk through it. Because you know the, the world of cyber, the world of IT, is so dynamic, it, it's constantly changing. So what might be in place today might not be in place in three months. So th that's what I would suggest uh, again for for incident response. All right, and Matt, do you wanna add anything to that in terms of what you're seeing uh, around corners coming up uh, with this new law and uh, other things that that you know folks should really focus on with their incident response plan? Should, should they always make sure to have an offsite uh, equipment, right? And versus just having it all in their office. So I should, think, should you be holding things off site? Yeah, I think one of the good reasons organizations utilize insurance and the expertise of insurers is to get kind of feedback on these kind of suggestions. Hey, how do we do we utilize the cloud and to what extent to, to what kind of data do we do we have there? Um, you know, it's interesting that um, the cybersecurity framework that was published, I want to say in 2014, is being rewritten and it's going to be version 2.0. Uh, it's a tool that businesses of all sizes, particularly critical infrastructures, are uh, urged to use. It's flexible um, and it's something that we often like to try to push uh, small businesses to use in partnership with, with uh, providers to kind of help them walk through it. The other thing I'll just add quickly is I've seen good use of, let's say, phishing training, non-punitive training. I think that's good since in addition to MFA, uh, you want to make sure folks aren't clicking on links and PDFs that are malicious. Okay, a um, lot more audience questions coming in. This is from Ellie Dodd. Uh, Ellie asked, what about universities uh, with or without a medical school, uh, institutions of higher learning, wouldn't they be considered critical? I yeah. believe they are part of the uh, government facilities sector uh, as of fairly recently. They were specifically called out as a subsector. You know, I might put in a plug for my uh, where I went to school, uh, Indiana University. Uh, they operate the higher ed information sharing and analysis center. So universities should get plugged into things like that to swap indicators and warnings and so forth. Okay. Um, this is an, a broad question. I think it's a really good one. I'll go to you, Matt, on it. Uh, Ursuline Foley asked, how do you see this impacting corporate governance and boards? Because boards of public companies and private companies are increasingly worried mm -hmm. about cyber 
uh, attacks. So you think this might change corporate governance for, for companies? I think it will kind of help solidify and validate what a number of organizations are already doing smartly. And let me put it this way. Circea demonstrates the right way to develop policy and conduct reporting to government. It's protected. There are liability protections. This legislation was developed in partnership with industry. There's supposed to be bilateral sharing, among other things. There are other agencies that have rulemakings that would push entities to report publicly before incidents are mitigated. It's not the right way to do it. So I would just say Circea is headed down the right path and kudos for them. Okay, um, Ken, this is gonna be for you. From Jamie James, Jamie asked, uh, so if the insured has cyber liability policy in place, wouldn't the carrier report to uh, CISA or does the insured still need to do this? That's a good question. And um, right now, for other types of reporting, um, the the carrier does not do the reporting. We would might recommend, you know, for example, uh, that the the insured the policyholder report to the to law enforcement. Um, also, whenever we're involved in a, a claim, there are other teams involved. Uh, one of which, very important teammate, is the breach coach team. So these are the attorneys that this is what they do is they help. Uh, with with breaches and and they would facilitate uh, that that communication for current reporting and I'm sure they would probably do the same for uh, the Circea reporting. Okay, another question coming in: How will this respond if an entity doesn't report immediately because that's the instruction within the ransom demand itself, not to advise anyone else outside the company until the ransom is paid? That's a really good one. Who wants to take that, Ken? That's a great point. Um, whether that will alleviate the the ransomware reporting requirement, I don't know. That may, you know, be discussed and factored in at some point, but um, it it probably would would not at this point uh, mitigate that responsibility to report. I would just say, by all indications, it's that payment that triggers that reporting. Okay. Uh, another question coming in from Misty Bob. Uh, this sounds similar to the suspicious activity report required by FinCEN. So do we know if this is similar to that reporting requirement at 30, 60, 90 days, or 365 days? And Ken, you're shaking your head? Yeah. Well, there's FinCEN. Um, there are several existing reporting requirements based on the, the business segment you're in. So financial has the FinCEN. Um, if you're a defense industrial base, so if you do manufacturing for the Department of Defense, you've had to report uh, for probably at least 10 years now, a uh, similar situation. So there are different reporting requirements in place right now. So hopefully they will uh, coalesce at some point. Uh, it will be interesting to see if one has uh, precedence over the other. And maybe just one kind of tidbit to throw in there. We are talking about reporting that's anchored to the disruption significant impact of critical infrastructure. There's a lot of different reporting out there, but think certain entities that if impacted, impacts critical infrastructure, triggering certain kinds of reporting. That's one way to think about it. Okay, this is a really good one. Coming in from Rich Carlson. Rich asked, will CISA pay entities for cost for covered incidents? Is the government gonna help you pay for this if you've been hacked? Has that been brought up in the discussions, Matt, at all? Uh, if, no, it has, yes. Um, ways to kind of mitigate costs definitely come up. Not direct payments. I don't think that is in the cards. One of the things that we are urging is for Congress to develop liability protections in conjunction with preemption, national preemption, for entities that can show conformance with industry-led standards, guidance, best practices, if they are supervised, if they're regulated, that liability protection ought to be higher, almost where uh, suits are dismissed. That's a means of mitigating costs when you're doing the right thing and you can show it. Okay. 
Uh, this is another interesting question um, from Jordan Delo. Uh, do these covered entities that have to report the cyber incident within at least 72 hours, is that from the time of the actual cyber attack or when the entity becomes aware of the cyber attack? That is a good question. And uh, as I believe it's from when they become aware of the cyber attack. Uh, it's a very good question. I think this is one thing that we went round and round on in developing the legislation. Right now it says, once an entity believes, reasonably believes, reasonably believes that it has suffered a covered cyber incident, then it has to report within 72 hours. You know, the problem with that is it, it, it benefits those looking back in hindsight. In the heat of the moment, entities may not reasonably believe that they've got a covered cyber incident on their hands. This will be uh, a point of debate. Okay. Uh, another question from Jeremy Dickey. At what point is an incident reportable? If I have an EDR that catches the actor before anything is exported, are we still required to report it? That's another good question. And um... The answer to that will probably be a yes, because the, it's it's not that there was a you stopped the de the attack from happening, but that there was an attack, you know, uh, uh, unauthorized access. Um, but I I do believe that actual damage might be one of the 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 key factors in determining whether or not this is a quote substantial and uh, report worthy incident. It's going to okay. be up for it's gonna be up for debate. I think keywords like substantial loss of data, I think in conjunction with disruption probably gets you in the zone of reporting. That's my guess. All right, uh, question coming in from Lee Covington. Uh, Lee's a leader in this industry. So what are some best practices for vendors with access to your systems, such as website vendors? So uh, Ken, I know you, you advise our clients every day about uh, their uh, systems are just as vulnerable as their weakest leak in the vendor chain. So how do we make our vendor contractors uh, be just as cyber clean as we are? Right, and uh, th that's part of the, the thrust, I think, for Circea in general is the, the supply chain third-party vendor uh, vulnerabilities that we've seen exploited. So they're, you know, the fundamental cyber hygiene steps that you would take for your own company, you would want your vendors and suppliers and third parties to follow as well. Um, th there's also the, the, the contracts that you have with your third parties uh, to ensure that they are pro using the adequate cybersecurity provisions. There's indemnification that your third parties may have to cover you in the event something happens that they might be responsible for. But at, at the end of the day, there's nothing that there's nothing that you should not do. So keep the, the cyber hygiene up, use follow the best practices, you know, multi-factor authentication for, for one thing. So you've got a, a third party service provider that provides support for your environment. They still need to use multi-factor to get into your environment. So that's just, you know, one of the, the tactical things that you can do to help manage that risk. Terrific. Well, um, Matt and Ken, I can't thank you enough. This has really been eye-opening for, I think, for a lot of our uh, audience members. And we will promise our audience that we will be back uh, next year as this law becomes uh, in, in effect. So we'll come back within the next 18 months to uh, talk again with Ken and Matt to see where we are. Because as you know, uh, as Matt has told us, things can change when the comment period ends. So Matt and Ken, thank you so much for your time today. We're truly grateful and we're gonna have you back on uh, without a doubt. So uh, I also, thank you. I also wanna let our audience know some of our really upcoming interesting programs uh, that we have on the docket. We do have a survey. If you could fill that out in the chat, I'd love to get your feedback. And I'm also looking to hear from our audience what you want us to talk about in 2023. We're planning right now so please let me know what topics you would like us to undertake on our webinar series. But as I mentioned, tomorrow we're in Los Angeles. So if you live around Los Angeles, we have a terrific program downtown. Go to travelersinstitute.org. You can register and sign up. Uh, we have some great guests there. October 19th on our webinar series, we're gonna hear from one of the leading voices at the Federal Reserve, the CEO of the Minneapolis branch, Neil Kashkari. 
is going to be with us to talk all things inflation, interest rates, and the economy. Uh, and then on October 26, we're going to discuss the outlook for the real estate market, both commercial and residential, with the chief economist of the National Association of Realtors, Lawrence Yoon. So I promise it's going to be a great lineup for November and December. We're going to get those to you uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, take care, my friends. Stay safe. And again, thank you to Ken and Matt.